everybody welcome to the quiet warrior show listen let me tell you about live streaming for a minute if you haven't been on a live stream we're streaming live across facebook linkedin and youtube and while you want to subscribe to my youtube channel that will help us do more of these and it'll give you the notification when we produce the youtube premiere of this epic interview that we're about to do live streaming lets you peek into the studio as we do an epic taping with a guest and man we have a great guest on today and i believe he's coming all the way from cabo san lucas let me tell you what he's doing in the green room he's sitting on a stool about this big his trainer has a sponge and he's sopping his head with a bunch of water because he's overheating he's putting some vaseline under his eyes so those gloves slide off his face well not really. <laughs> Dave Schulten is in the green room. He's an MMA fighter. He's looking to go back in the ring at age 50. And man, what a story this guy has. We connected. And before I bring on Dave, I want to tell you what I think of Dave. Yesterday, I had a meltdown and I don't talk about my show this way. But Dave and I were scheduled to go live yesterday. And well, things happened and I didn't make it. And he was waiting for me and I was embarrassed. Let me tell you something, everybody. I talk about vulnerability and talking about your weakness. I didn't want to tell Dave what really happened, but I did. And here's what he said to me. He said, we are all imperfect human beings. And that's the kind of guy Dave is. And so welcome to the live stream, Dave Schulten. Hey, Dave, how you doing? Uh, yeah. <laughs> awesome, man. I was just riffing offline with you, and I said, how do I show up today with a baseball cap and uh, prize fighter gloves or something? I don't have that body you have. But uh, listen, you were born in Hamilton, Ontario, and I think you're living in Cabo. Is that correct? Yeah, living in Cabo, San Lucas, Mexico. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, it looks like a cool place you have there. Well, Dave, we talked a little bit, and how we connected was just simply you observed my show, and we found there's some threads in our stories, man. I have a lot of respect for you already. Don't know you that well, but hey. Take us back, Dave. This is about the hero's journey. Age 50, you're looking at going back in as an MMA fighter. But I always say that there's something rooted in that. What happened to you or where did you come from, man, to, to get into MMA fighting? Take us back as early as you want. You lived on a 30-acre farm. Yeah, basically, I uh, grew up in Ontario uh, on 30-acre farm, like you said. And, uh, yeah, my dad made me work really hard. He was in the military in in holland and he was very strict and a lot of times um too strict and uh but uh, it made me it made me tough no doubt <laughs> but sometimes it wasn't the most healthy way of raising a kid i don't think so i've learned a lot of my journey and 
at 15, moved out to Vancouver, BC. And that's when I luckily got into wrestling. And uh, Jim Domke saw me as the smallest guy in the school, wrestling the biggest guy in the school. I think his name was Gordy Fulton. And him and his, uh, his, uh, all the other teachers were in the lunchroom watching us wrestle. I didn't know this, but I guess he saw a, a skinny kid uh, that didn't want to give up and uh, that wasn't afraid of a bigger guy kind of thing. So he came up to me. Um, I was a greasy haired, skinny kid in grade <laughs> nine. And, and he, he said, Hey, you got to get into wrestling. I hardly talked because uh, I was dealing with a lot of abuse at home, that sort of thing. So he got me in the wrestling. And I think that pretty much saved my life or altered the course of my life. So big shout out to Jim Donkey. He's one of my heroes. All right. We'll make him an unsung hero. Man, you got me going there, Dave, about the, the early back years. I mean, you know my story. My dad was a commanding officer in the British and then Canadian forces. And when you talk about strict, dude, I mean, we would go in the garage and clean up the garage at home. And the average buddy of mine would be in there for an hour sweeping. We'd win there eight hours. And uh, I think I knew my timetables in school before anybody even knew what they were. <laughs> and I've, and of course, then came my mom and she had the wooden spoon, right? So my dad would be at cadets and my mom would say, sit at the table and do your drills and whack if you didn't get it right. And But you mentioned tough, uh, tough growing up in that environment and made you tough. Uh, something happened, though, uh, early in your life uh, related to your dad. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it happened, you know, from what I can remember, is three or four in the crib, right? Um, I would pee the crib and I'd be getting suffocated in my own urine in the crib. So that's my first memory. Wow. Uh, and my dad was like 250, six foot two. He was a really, really big guy. So uh, basically, make a long story short, fast forward to when I was 16, he, he almost drowned me. And I almost died that day. And that was very, very traumatic. Uh, so I moved out of the house at 16 because I knew I could die if I, if I stayed in that household. It's, it's fight or flight, and I, choose, uh, I chose flight because uh, he, was, he was such a big, scary man and he you know, grabbed the rake and chased me around the house sometimes. And he had mental issues, right? And that's why I just want to say, hey, thanks to you for raising awareness also for mental health. And I did mention uh, a family friend, Mauro Ronello, uh, and, and his YouTube uh, documentary, The Bipolar Rock and Roller. He talks about it too. Uh, he's now f pretty famous and, and did the Mike T last Mike Tyson fight and the Floyd Mayweather, Conor McGregor fight. He announced that. So he's raising a lot of awareness too. And uh, yeah, and now Simone Biles in the Olympics, timely enough. Uh, it's great, great on her. I, I have so much respect for her. And she's a world-class athlete. And it just shows everybody has battles. When you get cut in your arm and it's bleeding, people are going to walk up to you and help you. But a lot of these people suffer in silence. And, and my dad was one of them, and he ended up killing himself because of it. So, um, yeah. Well, Dave, Dave, take a take a breath there. First of all, man, I love you and your story. I honor you, dude, for sharing it publicly. I mean, it, you get on a, a mic and you're sharing, and you know the world's watching, and to be vulnerable with a painful story. Uh, I read in your bio notes that your father tried to drown you in a creek that ran through the front of the house. I didn't know the back part about the crib, but dude, that's horrific. And one of the things I learned from my own experience was that in the first 10, 15 years, everything the brain sees and hears, it just buries it as fact. And then you spend a lifetime trying to get past that. Uh, it's funny. You said about your buddy there, the rock and bipolar rock and roller. I like that handle. I did watch yeah. his video and love to oh, get cool. to know him. Yeah. He, uh, you know, Dave, I talk about this on the show. If you go to the archives, everybody, we're approaching 200 episodes. I, as a, as a guy who started a show just to do something good, I had no idea. But Dave, we have, I've got people lined up for months just wanting to get on this. And when I look at the archives, I go, wait a second, 80 to 90 percent of people in the world are like us, dude. Uh, if you listen to Oprah, she says 90 percent, but they've got some broken backstory. And yet, for a long time, I felt there was something wrong with me, and I was a minority. And I did look at some of your video about your when you were doing wrestling, and you're pretty amazing. And I wouldn't have thought that you had that in your backstory. So let's go to the let's go to the how. I mean, why MMA fighting? And you you got into that. 
some might say, hey, that's a, sometimes that's a tough sport to watch. Maybe there's a bit of violence in it. I mean, why MMA and what, what drove you? Why that? Yeah. Yeah, I just, I, I just want to touch on what you just said. Just a shout out to anybody that's listening to that's struggling uh, just to speak up. And, and uh, that was my toughest thing for 40 years. I never told anybody uh, the things I'm going to tell you now. I wouldn't tell my best friend of 25, 30 years. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I got into wrestling and uh, Moro actually, Ronaldo, after uh, my father had hung himself in a tree, killed himself, my sister got murdered. She got stabbed by her ex-husband. He killed her and her new boyfriend. So that was a long time ago. That's why I'm able to speak about it now because I've dealt with the trauma and worked my way through it. And as you mentioned, um, uh, what you were talking about is inner child, right? We're not there anymore. Yeah. So you work through that inner child because at the end of the day, we're all children still inside. And, uh, you know, we don't really want to lose that, the lust for life and all the great things about children. And, uh, but wrestling, uh, because of Jim Domke, and then Jake Uzinga, another great coach of mine who's now in Washington State at a university teaching football. Another shout out to Jake Uzinga. And the wrestler I looked up to, Corey Quack. Uh, he was a Canadian champion, and I'll never forget, uh, you know, watching him and uh, looking up to him and then uh, having someone to look up to and have a goal to become like Corey Quack, our Canadian champion. Um, so once I got into wrestling, Moro Ronello, I, I fought so much on the street because I would fight bullies. I would never look for a fight. I would never pick on someone smaller than me. But if I saw anybody acting like a bully, you know, the typical drug dealer guy or, or tattoos walking yeah. through the bar like this in the small town that would be, you know, pushing people or being disrespectful. I would be the first one, the small guy, to say, hey, man, have some respect. And that would always usually enter enter into a fight so i i would be fighting bullies and now when i because i study psychology uh looking back i was actually fighting my father people that acted like my father so bullies i couldn't stand bullies i hated bullies so i would fight so much so fighting became so natural to me and and i was good at it i i i've never been knocked out in my life and uh moral would jump up and down in my mom's house because Morrow was a DJ in Abbotsford at a place called Animals. Uh, Jamie Dahl owned it, a, a friend of mine, and he would be the DJ. And then when my sister got murdered, he fundraised for my sister's three kids because uh, now uh, my niece and my two nephews, they never had any parents. The, the mother's dead and the father's doing life in prison. So I was like the father figure, and then they got adopted by a, a Christian family in, in Abbotsford. And uh, so Moro became like really good friends of the family. He actually announced me in, in wrestling back in the day. So he sat in my dad's chair for the next eight years and became best friends with my mother. So uh, then wrestling, uh, I ended up, I was number one in Canada three years in a row, set for the Olympic trials. And then I got in a car accident, uh, flipped over five times end over end in my Fiero. Wow. And I had punctured lungs and I was choking on blood and my chunks of lungs. I was in the ditch, knocked out, and I, I woke up. And, uh, and then I remember a crowd of people around me asked me what my name was. I said, Dave Shulton. And they said, when were you born? And I couldn't remember. So wow. it was a concussion. So to answer your question, um, after that, I just gave up wrestling and then got into MMA because Moro was like, you're meant for this, you're meant for this. <laughs> but I never really took it seriously. I just used my natural ability. And and uh, now I'm, I'm very focused and I, I, I make my last run for the, for, for uh, to make it to the UFC. That's amazing. First of all, I didn't know about that, uh, the accident. I think I picked up the concussion thread. You know, my story, falling in a bathtub in 18 and still working yeah. through that. In fact, as I yeah. talk to you now, I've got double vision. They gave me these funny glasses. If I take these off, Dave, the gap between the left and right eye is about six centimeters. So just want to tell you, you look like there's two of you. It's scared now. <laughs> but I mean, when you get concussed, you don't know the journey. And I started thinking about that in, in sports, how many athletes get knocked on the head and don't know the consequences. And one of the side effects I didn't anticipate was mental health. As I said in a TED Talk I did, I had my first suicidal thoughts. I had second ones, which was really thinking about my daughter 
uh, who's 23, hanging by herself by a rope in her dorm room back on the other side of the country. And I learned, Dave, that I didn't know this, man, but suicidal thoughts aren't just about killing yourself, but it's a, you can have thoughts of other people uh, harming themselves. Uh, just the brain was just doing weird things. Everybody, we're talking to Dave Scholten. He's a, a legend in my mind. I got to tell you that you know, if you haven't seen the beginning of this, go back and watch it. But if you think your life's tough, Dave uh, uh, started on a farm in Ontario, Canada. Uh, his father had a mental illness, tried to drown him, and uh, one would say maybe hurt him throughout that early part. His dad hung himself from a tree and took himself out. Uh, Dave's sister was murdered and her new boyfriend. And then Dave uh, decided, instead of letting that define him, he decided to let it shape him. And yet, can you imagine everybody with a mind that's polluted like that, uh, how Dave got into the field of wrestling, rolls the car, <laughs> concussion, and then again, you're looking down the squarely at the barrel of a shotgun. What's the purpose and meaning of my life? Dave, was there ever a moment, especially after the, the car accident, or let's be real, man, because you're no BS, Dave, here. Every day in my life is a journey. I wake up and there are some days I don't know what the future looks like. Some days you have this fight forward and some days you just want to quit. How do you keep fighting forward? And then MMA, you're looking at age 50 to go back into that. Tell us what are you doing mentally to prepare for that? Yeah, yeah. well, just so you know, I've been training for about five months, uh, six days a week. So I'm actually in, in, in training camp and, and I'm probably going to fight in the next two to three months. I'm just going to select the uh, the organization, and uh, it'll be an organization outside of the UFC. I'm nine wins, four losses, so I'm looking to pick up two or three more wins and then knock on the UFC's door or, or Bellator and uh, take it from there. But um, um, sorry, what was your question, Tom? Uh, my apologies. Yeah, the, the question was after the car accident and then just – I was saying that oh, there's yeah, some days, yeah. some days we wake up, uh, yes. you know, people, you wake up and you just want to fight for it. Some days it's a battle. And the truth is most people don't realize, I'd like to know what you say, that yeah. we're not, we're not, we're never perfect and okay. There's always that battle against the demons, the voices. What do you, what do you do? You're preparing for MA, but what do you do to keep fighting forward mentally? Yeah, basically for me, like I like to help others through trauma and, and struggles. And anytime I can, I'd like to, you know, give advice uh, from what I've been through and that sort of thing. And always remembering that uh, there's always people going through a tougher time. I mean, um, if you, one of the books I recommend is um, uh, Victor Frankl, A Man's Search for Meaning. I mean, his, his whole family got taken out by the, by the, uh, in the Holocaust, yeah. that sort of thing. And, and, there's always somebody with a worse story. I mean, I could have been born in Africa and died at four years old of starvation. So what drives me nuts in, in, in society are these complainers and whiners, and, and they don't realize all you need to have is gratitude. So to answer your question, I wake up every morning and I just try to remember I have two hands, two feet, and I have gratitude. I'm breathing fresh air. I could be living in a big city in China and in the smog, you know, uh, with 1.2 billion people and, and, and a communist government like that. So it's like, you know, take a look at, at how fortunate you are. All you need is health, a roof over your head and food in the fridge and air to breathe. Other than that, everything else is a bonus. So, so a shout, you know, uh, the thing I want to say to, to people out there is, you know, I, I can't stand complainers and whiners. So have <laughs> gratitude for what you have. That's that's all I can do. Yeah, I love it. I'm just going to read this off a piece of paper here. You mentioned advice, everybody. That was a teaching moment. Go back and listen to Dave again. He just said it. You know, Dave's no BS. Uh, I love that. You know, he don't be a hate, don't be a whiner. Don't be a complainer. Dave, I, I learned that, too, that we have a choice. We can choose the thoughts that we want to have. That's the power of the brain. And yet there's so many people get stuck like us who are whiners and complainers this is what you wrote uh follow your passion work hard keep your true circles small surround yourself with positive energy protect yourself with boundaries man i should tattoo that on my forearm uh those are great words of wisdom mixed martial arts tell me a little bit about that i have a general understanding tell me about the sport and yeah. uh anything else yeah so basically about mixed martial arts. When it first came out, I wasn't that into it. 
I had a guy named Chris Nicholson that uh, invited me over to his house in Abbotsford at UFC one. It's like, Shulton, you got to come see this. You got to come see this. And I went and saw it. And it's a 400 pound guy against a 170 pound guy. And, this uh, karate against a uh, wrestler and different styles. And it was interesting, but I just didn't have any rules and I didn't uh, really like the sport. So then he called me again on the next one and, and uh, I didn't really like it. And then it kind of grew on me as I understood it more. So I understand people that don't like the violence and, and, and stuff, but it's controlled and nobody's forcing us into the cage. So it's more like a chess match and it's a competition and they have so many safety standards that it's a lot safer than boxing and boxing you get knocked down and they give you a standing eight count or, or 10 count and yeah and then may it's over as soon as you're knocked out they call the fight or tapped out and, and you get to tap out so it's and it's got a lot of rules so so when it started you you know you can do anything but now it has a lot of rules so it grew on me and then like i said more was like dave you're meant for this you're meant for this and and uh, that's how i got into the sport so that's pretty cool. Uh, I want to ask you about what why you're doing it. Uh, I think I know the answer, but there are two types of people that I've learned. I'm going to use me as an example, follow my sword, Dave, that I was climbing the ladder of success, always needing to win awards and achieve things. And somebody said this to me, that when you're in the room of your mom, you have everything you need. You have safety and warmth and you're enough. We're, in, we're born happy. And then the world convinces us in order to be happy, we need to do more and achieve more. And then we get layers coming into our life storylines of the things you went through and I went through with my dad. And I was searching for the love and really appreciation of my father. That was a big thread of why I was doing what I was doing. To, today, I just want to give this to you, man, as, as, as a, a, a sharing from me to you that now when I do something, if I stepped in the ring for a minute, it's with a very different purpose. It's, with, it's not because I'm, I'm trying to patch up something missing in my soul. Uh, you seem like a guy who's really got it together. So why 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 are you doing this? Why isn't yeah. enough enough? That, that, that's a great question. That's what a lot of people ask you. Why, man? Are you crazy? That's, <laughs> <laughs> I've been cra been called crazy many times in my life. <laughs> when I jumped on my motorbike from Vancouver to Argentina, thirty two thousand kilometers, people call me crazy. <laughs> Going through Nicaragua, El Salvador, but you made you had a couple good points there, uh, Tom. And um, people have to realize the day you were born you were enough, okay? That's that's number one. The day you were born, you were enough. Yeah. So we have to unlearn all these things you were talking about, Tom. We have to unlearn all the bullshit that society puts on us, that you have to have this and you have to do this. and You need all these accolades and, 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 and things like this, but you don't. You just need to be a good person, help other people, and the world would be way more better off that way but uh, too many people are are trying to uh, chase money and that sort of thing and and, and it's kind of sad because there is enough food on the planet for everybody but everybody's not eating because it's so unbalanced that that you know top five percent the corporations the banksters and the government and all this corruption and, and religion gets intertwined so, um, like you said about your mother, everybody wants to be loved. So, um, that's the main thing. You got to live with love and, uh, you know, you learn that uh, along the way. And why am I doing it now? Well, I was a victim uh, as a kid. So I, I fight for children for the last five years. Um, I want to raise awareness against child sex slavery. It's real. And, um, could you imagine, I don't have kids, but can you imagine having kids that are forced into sex because it makes money. Well, I guess can't. what? It's happening in every country, US, Canada, uh, Cambodia's horrible, India, and they get shipped to different places and promised different things and then get locked up in a room having sex with, with men with money, you know, 10 to 50 times in a day. It's disgusting. Yeah. And if, if I'm gonna live for one thing, it's gonna be protecting innocent children, so. Oh, I love it. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Dave. It was in the notes. Uh, I was going to get to that. The mission I wrote it down is everybody just listen to Dave. He's taken his mess, turned it into a message, and he's got that mission there. But Dave, it, it makes me sick when you talk about the the way children are treated like that. And you know, I'm 
you've done some world traveling, man, and uh, especially with your your fighting that you've done. I think I read it that you're an avid traveler, something like 50 countries. Uh, maybe that's it. Uh, tell us about one of the craziest stories while you were traveling, anything at all, just to give us a perspective through your eyes. Yeah, I mean, um, when I was riding, I, I guess I'll just tell you a story about uh, when I was riding to Argentina, um, I was in the mountains in Peru, and, and, and uh, I think it was Peru or Bolivia, but it was the altitude was really high, and I'm going through the mountains in this crazy road with all these turns, and it kind of throws you off of it, that altitude, and I've got my, my leathers on, and, and uh, it was kind of cold in the mountains, and then I was passing this big bus, and there's a, a corner not too far ahead, and I, I took the chance, took the corner, and all of a sudden, um, I, I, I don't know, it was a patch of water or something, and I slid in the bike, I slid and hit into a, a barricade. <laughs> if that barricade wasn't there, the cliff was like, I don't know, 100 feet down at least. But uh, basically, make a long story short, it was that curb that saved me. So that was the one, one crazy wipeout on, on, on my story. But other than that, I had no issues. And people ask me, you know, because I've been to, it's actually over 50 countries, they ask me, what can you tell me about traveling and, and life? So what I say is that people are inherently good. Now, you wouldn't think that if you watch the news because it's like a train wreck. Everybody wants to, to look at the train yeah. wreck. And that's sad. I don't really watch the news because it's all negative. And, and I put in good things, uh, you know, uh, like tank good news uh, on Instagram as an example. And I try and stay away from social media because I think it's uh, becoming a sickness to a lot of people. And I want to talk to the younger people about that. I'm very passionate about that. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I recommend stay away from the news and put in good information. And, uh, and, uh, and, and you are what you, you put into your head, right? Yeah, you're talking to the converted here and it's funny because when i work with others especially people in leadership they, they what they do with their first last hour of the day is just sad you know the news on the uh, the cell phone and uh, negative energy you you really get it man i was thinking about the word uh, worldview you have a worldview i mean your memoirs are going to be some but uh, for a guy like you who's traveled everybody you got to get to know dave and reach out and learn because you bring us perspective that you know, even going to India, Dave, that's my roots, but I've never been there. I just did an yeah. interview with a fellow who was from there. He said, you know, he went and, and wept. Yeah, it brings you perspective what you see, what you see on the street there. Yeah. It's kind of funny. I was watching a cooking show. It's one of my passions, as you probably know from following me. And they took us, uh, they, they took the, the travelers to the show into a place where all these women were cooking. And they, they were in poverty. And they asked us, the lady who was leading the conversation, if you just picture all these old women in saris and there's some young of them and they're cooking and the place is hot and they're all smiling, Dave. And the, the interviewer said, where did where did they come from? And, and she said, many of them uh, were found on the side of the road. And man, my heart just like I literally melted into this emotional puddle. And I'm thinking, holy crap, can you imagine in a country of billions of people that you're born and you get lost on the side of the road and you spend the rest of your life? you know, cooking, but as you're doing what you're doing. And then she said, after that, they put them in a, a home. They have a, a compound set up where they age. That's their life. But these women are smiling. And I thought about what you yeah, said. Yeah, they yeah. don't know what they don't have and they choose to be happy. So we really there can learn know. from you. That, that struck a chord with me, uh, Tom, because um, they're probably a lot happier than, um, I heard a story the other day, and obviously I'm not going to mention any names, but a very wealthy person um, that uh, I was told through a very, very good friend uh, in Cabo here that um, they were thinking about uh, taking their life, and, and he's very, very wealthy. Yeah. So money has nothing to do with it or status or none of that. It's all a hallucination. And, and, and the thing that I can relate to about what you said about those ladies in the kitchen. I sometimes see that too. I see, you know, uh, an older person working in behind a kitchen. They're smiling and I walk in a, a little grumpy or whatever. And I'm thinking, man, this lady's happier than I am. And then I do a, a check with myself saying, 
Why is that? So I was in Africa, and I'll never forget, I was sitting there watching these kids at a school rolling these bald tires, and they were laughing and smiling, and it's etched in my head, I'll never forget it. And I was just watching how happy and joyful they were. I'm like, we can learn so much from kids, and that's why I love nature, kids, and uh, uh, those are the things that, uh, and animals, those are the three things that uh, I, I really uh, focus on in life, and, that, and that's what makes, makes me happy. Animals, nature, and, and children, because what happens to us adults, don't ask me. Yeah. But I'm sorry, but, but uh, those are the beautiful things in life, but I'll never forget that in Africa. Well, everybody, a teaching moment from Dave on the show. Uh, 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 children, uh, animals, and what was the other one? Children nature. And nature. nature. And it's funny you say that because when I reflect, we live in, well, Dave's a Canadian. You know where I live. And uh, around the Burrard Inlet, there's a lot of trails. Probably some of my happiest times just in nature. And uh, I know that kids have a childlike uh, way about them. And when you hang, I hang around my granddaughter, you just see them. They're innocent. They don't have this use of the rational brain. So they just don't know what they don't know. And, you know, they say if you want to find your passion, go hang around kids. It's amazing to me. Dave, I want to go back uh, as we're heading towards the uh, last part of the segment of this amazing interview. We'll have you back to talk more because there's so much we can learn from you. I want to talk about our fathers again for a minute. I know it's not always an easy subject because they're both gone. Mine passed away uh, January 18. Uh, my dad was 22 years dry from alcohol with AA, but I had this huge gap in my life. I never, I purposely avoided him. And you just quickly to keep the spotlight on you, you we heard about how your father passed. He uh, committed or took his life uh, by hanging himself. My, my dad had an unexpected heart attack, but I think my dad through his life had some form of mental illness. His father was a alcoholic. And so what happened was a few months before he passed, I think God, I'm a faith-based guy. God sent me to connect with him. And I did at a coffee shop, probably after a decade of, and I was somewhat feeling shame about not respecting him. Uh, I kept him from my grand, my daughter. And uh, we know that we, we, there's forgiveness and all this stuff and tears and then I said, tell me about grand granddad. And what I learned is his life growing up was like his. His granddad, he got pushed off a bridge. That's how he learned to swim in Fiji. His, his my grandfather was a very bad alcoholic who died in the house from alcohol poisoning and probably didn't treat my dad well. And then I thought about that. And so I turned What year did your dad die? Sorry? What's that? What year did your dad die? In uh, January 2018. It was just, oh, okay. yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. just six months before I, I had my fall in the bathtub there and got my concussion. Wow. But what's interesting, Dave, is I was able to, there was forgiveness, but I was able to understand the roots of my dad's life, which allowed me to change. You brilliantly taught us the mind. So this is what I say now. The gifts I have today, the ability to, you know, for example, do something for eight hours at a high level, outworking everybody, comes from the what my dad taught me i just couldn't see it back then as good so what what's the gift in all the mess what's the gift that you've taken out of your father's yeah. life okay well you, you made a good point i just want to um, say a very very good point you never know what somebody's going through always remember that you know if if somebody gives you a bit of an attitude at the till when you're checking out the grocery store or something, you don't know if their dog died, if their mother died, that you, your dad died, like like you, that sort of thing. So you you had the knowledge and, and, and the thought process to think, well, let's find out where my dad came from and my grandpa, right? So my grandparents got the door kicked down by the Nazis oh, as boy. they came and stole all, all the pigs from their pig farm. So, so I did my research and, uh, and that sort of thing. So always, always try and understand that, that other people have, everybody's got a story. Trauma is trauma. Um, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the same thing, whether it's big or small, it's still trauma. It still affects people for the rest of their life. One person uh, mentioned a story about uh, a fear of heights and I was just wondering why and I knew there was a trigger and then uh, that person told me their dad held them by the ankles over a 14-story building. Oh, my God. And, and that sort of thing. So, I mean, the great thing about the Internet, and, and, and I know I'm, I'm not a big 
a fan of social media because it's just highlights and it puts people into feeling bad about themselves and it's not reality. But one good thing is, is about the information out there. So uh, Psychology Today is one of the, my favorite websites and I've learned so much from that site. But um, um, yeah, basically always remember everybody's going through something. So try and keep that in mind. Um, and, and, and you mentioned about weakness. So, so I wanted to let people know about my weakness. Because I had so much anger against my father, I was 100 pounds when he almost drowned me, and he was 250 pounds. Wow. So, so I had all this anger, so I took that on the wrestling mats, but that anger also came with uh, impatience. So, um, you know, to anybody in the past where I've been very impatient or anybody I've hurt, uh, an apology to anybody. But um, it's, it's been 40 years, uh, over 40 years, that um, I've never opened up. And uh, I, I do know, you know, they want to film a documentary on my life. Um, I'm talking to Netflix and a few other uh, private companies that are interested in, in doing a documentary. So I, I'm ready to move forward. They're, they're filming a trailer uh, right now. Um, but um, I know I have a story to tell, and, and I have to say uh give a shout out to roy duquette he's the one that got me to open up uh roy duquette owns olympic gym in uh in vancouver on commercial drive a great gym yeah he's fixing <laughs> up really well and uh he, he's the owner a great guy very very uh successful and, and uh, a personal trainer a body like uh, olympus you know <laughs> he's got a, a strong man and a smart man so i respect him a lot but he, he was the one. He invited me out for coffee, and, and I thought it was, it was random because we didn't hang out too much just working out and stuff. He said, I want to take you out for coffee. And he said to me, he goes, Dave, I tell everybody about you, but nobody knows who you are. And I said, I don't give a shit. I grew up on a, on a farm in Ontario. I don't care if anybody knows who I am. He goes, Dave, I'm going to tell you something, not as a friend, but as a neutral person. He goes, your life isn't one in a million. It's one in a billion. And then it made me sit back and I'm like, what are you talking about? And, th and then he was like, well, Dave, you've never done drugs. You've never had an issue with alcohol. You started your company, you know, over 25 years ago. It's still in business. Uh, you know, you had your thing with your dad, your sister, and, you, you know, you became the champion of Canada. And he started listing off these things. And, and for me, I've lived it. So to me, it's my normal. So yeah. um, Roy was the one that actually – you know, made me realize I have a story to tell and I can help other people. And then I, I met Sean Danica, my success coach. And uh, another shout out to her. She's, she is a, a very, very smart girl. Sean, S-I-A-N, Danica. And um, the business of you, that's her business. And she really changed my frame of mind to live more through love and, and, and that sort of thing. And, and, about feminine energy and, and all that kind of stuff. I've been working on that instead of, you know, <laughs> the alpha male sort of thing that, that I grew up uh, fighting as a tough guy and all that kind of stuff. As you get older, you learn, you know, you can help other people. And, and Sean Danica and Roy Duquette are two people that have really helped me out. Yeah, I'm going to, when I watch this back, Dave, as we produce it, we'll be doing an international podcast and then a second production, a YouTube premiere. It's going to be epic. I, uh, my mind's going on a journey in many places right now. And this happens when I have an authentic guest. So like you that tells stories, I did, I, you know, you don't have an ego, man, but I didn't know who you were. I, I heard the name and I kind of looked you up when you and I connected, but that's the thing I love about you, Dave, man, is that it doesn't matter. The people who the world doesn't know, they're the real ones. They're the ones, the ones people, everybody knows are the ones who are bragging about themselves. And they say that when you tell your story, tell it to the tribe that deserves to hear it and y y there's millions of people dave out there that want to hear your story i think your memoir and whatever you do dude will be very well received uh we'll be there in the front row to to help you and promote whatever you do because we're on a parallel mission i you. you're welcome i was also remarked at the fact that you just took us through your life no drugs no alcohol amazing I'm looking at all the things that you can teach people. Uh, when I struggled, I turned to a bit of drinking. My dad turned to alcohol. So we can all learn from you. What, what's that one thing that gave you the resilience? Uh, I think that's yeah. why you're a champion. Uh, yeah. and, and I really see something in you that 
is so obvious now, Dave, on, on the interview that you have this mastery of controlling your thoughts. You just really understand that, which is, um, which is awesome. Yeah, it's, it's amazing that I feel a, a, a connection with you, Tom, just because everything you're saying are things that, that I talk about. It's, uh, and then you've interviewed so many people and you understand life uh, like, like a lot of people don't because you're, you're delving into people's lives and you're getting tidbits yeah. of information. So you just said, said another thing that I'm a huge proponent on. The biggest thing in life, mastery of self-control. And if you can control your emotions, you can control anything. And this is the biggest message I'll tell anybody. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, some people look at me as a mentor and, and some younger people. And, and one girl the other day, actually, I said to her, I said, listen, when I got in trouble in my life or any problems I've had, it was when my emotions got out of control. So uh, that's, that's about controlling your emotions. If you can control you, con controlling of self, and emotions, you can control anything in this world, and anything's possible. So you don't think people are laughing at me that I'm I'm, I'm trying to make the UFC at 50? Um, you know, I, I was pretty close four years ago, and then I had some friends like Dennis Kang, who's had uh, probably about 30 more fights than George St. Pierre, um, and he was interviewed. And, and uh, four years ago, when I was getting close, I was training with uh, I remember Sarah Kaufman the best MMA fighter in Canada on the island. And I took the ferry across. And when I got into Tuasen, I got rear-ended by a semi-truck. So that ended my uh, run four years ago. But um, uh, at davescholtons.ca is uh, my blog. And that's where uh, all the MMA community and guys like Colin Danes and Olympian and Kelly Lockbaum that played for the BC Lions, they're all you know, talking about my character and they've known me for over 20 years, all of them. So uh, that's why I have that blog. So anybody that is interested in following my journey, it's davescholton.ca. You can click on the blog and my training videos will be on there and, and information. That's amazing, Dave. We'll put that in the show notes and I'll be sure to pick up all the names you mentioned. If with your permission, we'll put those in there to honor all your mentors. I wanted yeah. to mention a couple yeah. things about men mentors as we move to the last few minutes here that I lost my father when I was 12, I think that's when he left home. And they say many who lose their fathers or mothers, we're, we go out, we find other mentors. And the mentors I found in the business world, the high ego executives where I grew up, they weren't really mentors. Many of them covered up their, their uh, vulnerability. They weren't. They thought, what are they going to think of me? The real mentors are the ones I meet like you. Uh, people who share and have the backstories and they're proud of it. And the fact that you've done something with this, Dave, to to help others being in service, I think that that's a big, that's really the biggest lesson I learned from uh, today. I want to honor you with a few leadership words. I write these down as I'm doing this. Those watching the video will see me on my pa paper here. The first one is mental toughness. You are mental toughness, man. I can feel that, see that. Uh, two, you're real. Uh, you know that uh, you don't come across as a guy who's just telling a story for ego. Three, resilience. I think in the there's a picture of you in the dictionary under resilience. But I, each time you said something, there's another story. You know, rolled the car, <laughs> got rear-ended, ended. And you just never quit fighting forward. That is really the biggest part of this story. And the fourth one is humility, uh, Dave. I was going to say, take your shirt off and show us what a prize fighter or somebody preparing for a fight looks like. But, you know, here's Dave. He's got a nice uh, casual shirt on and, you know, you're not you're not bragging about yourself. So I think that's pretty awesome. I'm going to induct yeah. you into the Quiet Warrior Tribe and then we'll give it back to you for the last word. So you're getting an award today, Dave. I think uh, okay. you might have seen this, but I'm going to put me on the screen here. And so if you just take a look at by the screen screen backdrop there, that is a challenge coin. Challenge coins were created in World War uh, two, they were created to build community, Dave. And so I had this vision of this show. I didn't know it would go the way it did, but I wanted to bring together quiet warriors, people like me who work quietly around the world with their purpose, taking their mess, turning it into something passionate. And they showed up with no BS. And when you receive this coin, Dave, you become part of the quiet warrior tribe. I think we're now in over 15 countries. Very few of these go out a year. 
and we're all connected by that single thread, man. And together, I call it a superpower. Just imagine when you look at the show archives, all the choir words you're connected to. So congratulations. I hope to meet you in person and give you this. Otherwise, we'll get it to you. Welcome to the tribe. Thank you, Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And what a great vision. And, and uh, I can imagine 10 years from now, Tom, um, uh, what you're doing and, and where it's going to be. So uh, that's, that's awesome what you're doing. And uh, congratulations to you for just starting small, just like Joe Rogan. No different. Yeah, that's you're, right. you're a guy, you know, no, Joe Rogan's the most famous podcast in the world. And you know why? You hit the nail on the head. He's real. Yeah. That's it. When everyone's talking about veganism, all this stuff, he's talking about how he eats meat because he doesn't care. He says it the way it is. And, and, and that's it. And that's what people like. That's people right. like real people. So, so after my fighting career, which will be shortly after 50, making my run at the UFC, um, I'm going to be a motivational speaker. And yeah, the quiet warrior, um, I've been very quiet and to myself. And I realize now I can't be as quiet. And, um, you know, my nickname from some of my friends is anti BS Dave, as you know, because uh, <laughs> I don't like bullshit. And, and where'd I get that from? My mom, she taught me all the things, uh, you know, in sales on sale and 30% <laughs> more and all the bullshit in the, in this world were conditioned to buy. So a couple things. Uh, to end off would be, first of all, parents, please put your kids in the sports. Uh, save my life, save my trajectory. If they have high energy, you don't give them pills for ADD and all this kind of stuff. You let them use their energy somewhere. Or arts, put them in arts or sports or something that they're passionate about that they like. If you see them, you know, latch on to something, then put them in that sport or in that activity. And, uh, and last but not least, parents need to um, be held accountable. I'm sorry. Their kids on their phones, they have to uh, put limits where their phone has a lock on it after a certain amount of period, like an hour, two hours, whatever they want, to each in their own. But I'm sorry, all these kids, uh, they're going to be uh, going down an unhealthy path on their phones with no connection. And like you said, walking out in nature that's why people feel so good after going for a walk in nature and stuff. So that, those are my last words. And I hope uh, you follow my journey at DaveShilton.ca. And I look forward to being a motivational speaker. And I will be doing a TED Talks also, Tom. So I'll be following your lead. That's fantastic. And uh, if you're looking for a stage, hit me up. But I'm sure you'll find one. I I, I think the word thought leader. And uh, Dave, if you have time on, uh, I believe it's Friday, I'm doing another live stream and being interviewed on why uh, what is a thought leader? And I think that's what we're hearing from Dave. He's, he's going to become a thought leader. There's much to that. And I believe, Dave, you're right on. You, you need to go there. I'd love to stand on a stage one day side by side with you and trade stories. Uh, and I want, I, you know, you did it again, man. Every time I want to wrap this up, you say something and my brain goes over here. So we're going to, because we're live and we have the you know, benefit of extra tape. When you early in the interview and everybody go back, it's a teaching moment. You talked about uh, you never picked on anybody. You never fought for the sake of fighting. You stood up for bullies or you stood up against those being bullied. I, a friend of mine, he's a fellow author, wrote a book and he asked me for a quote for the cover. And I said, uh, s s learning to stand up to, the, to a bully is the first step in learning to stand up for yourself. And when you said that, man, it just took me back. I, I was bullied as a kid for various reasons, color, skin, size of my body. And there were guys like you in the schoolyard, man, who would be standing there laughing and joining in. And yet you, you, would, you would stand up for me. So I love you, man. And on that note, everybody find uh, this amazing interview. Give the YouTube channel a, a rating and subscribe to it so you can get the release of this video when it comes out. Find The Quiet Warrior Show on your favorite podcast channel, and we'll be releasing the international podcast to honor Dave's story. And live like Dave does with the true passion. Find that purpose. Live life that you deserve and desire. Hey, Dave, thanks, man, for being here. Thanks for all your work, Tom. And uh, good luck with uh, your show in the future. And hopefully we'll connect again. And I'll check out the live stream uh, on Friday. All right, brother. Thanks, Dave. See you again. Thank you. See ya.